Hi, welcome to Author Spotlight. My name is Lucy and this is the program on AADL TV where in each episode I take some time to talk about some of the works of an author. I say some specifically today because the author that I am going to be telling you about is Kelly Link. Kelly Link is a master short story writer. She has written five short story collections, one of which was a Pulitzer Prize finalist. She's also won Hugo Awards and Nebula Awards. She was a recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant, and she is also recently the author of a novel. All of her writing is so full of ideas. It is beautiful and imaginative and strange and she's just a writer whose work is so easy to revere and to fall into and want to read again and again but she's a writer that's very difficult to explain. At the end of her story collection Magic for Beginners there is an interview between Kelly Link and the author Joe Hill. Joe Hill shares a Flannery O'Connor quote Flannery O'Connor, the author of A Good Man is Hard to Find, had expressed dismay at a college English class's interpretation of her story. And Flannery O'Connor said, the meaning of a story should go on expanding for a reader the more he thinks about it, but meaning cannot be captured in an interpretation. Too much interpretation is certainly worse than too little, and we're feeling for a story is absent. Theory will not supply it. And I share that with you just because I think it's a good example of even trying to attempt to talk about what Kelly Link writes. Her stories are very open to interpretation, but there are certain themes that you see running throughout her stories and running even throughout her novel. She's always sort of presenting a puzzle as if her job is to present us with the puzzle. Our job is to solve it. There are a couple of stories that are really interesting in this collection, Magic for Beginners. The first one is called The Fairy Handbag, and it is a story about a woman named Genevieve. She's the narrator, and she shares stories about her sort of odd eccentric grandmother, Zofia, and this handbag that her grandmother had that was very memorable. Genevieve describes the handbag's purported supernatural powers and properties and talks about an incident when her childhood friend Jake mysteriously vanishes into the handbag. And this sort of leaves this mark on Genevieve's childhood and she's just constantly searching for Jake and that is how the story starts with this search for Jake. The beginning is in a movie theater and Genevieve is talking about Jake disappearing, but Jake's actual disappearance doesn't happen until the end of the story. So the story isn't focused on Jake disappearing because we know that that happens at the beginning, but the story is focused on the reasons why. And that's where the story gets really complex. There's a reason why this handbag has supernatural powers. And when people go into it, it sort of skews time so that Zofia, Genevieve's grandmother, is actually very old, like 200 years old. And in learning about the handbag, you even wonder why Jake would want to go into it. The story plays a lot with time and sort of doorways, in a sense, entering this handbag. There is a hill that people hide under in a village and that appears in another story later. It's sort of a good example of these liminal spaces that I think show up in a lot of Kelly Link's writing. The last story in this collection called Lull, it really makes a nice bookend because it is very much a story about playing with time. It is a story within a story within a story and it's hard to know which way time goes forwards and backwards. In fact, for much of the story, time goes backwards. So you are slowly kind of disappearing. You're growing younger and younger and younger, but you know things about your older self. You have memories about them. The story seems to be being told to us by one person, and then it there's a phone call to a person who's gonna tell another story, and then that person tells a story about devil and a cheerleader in the closet. The cheerleader asks the devil for a story. So it's just layered with these stories. Going back and forth in time does an interesting thing to think about 
the erasure of people. Like if you're growing older, you're always creating memories and people who know you will remember you. If you're growing younger, you're erasing yourself and there's nothing to remember. And that's a really interesting concept, interesting to hold in your mind when you're reading other stories of Kelly Links and when you're reading her novel. In Lull, there is mention of a hill that people live under. There are also a lot of doors in Lull and there's a house that someone buys that has a door that goes nowhere. This idea of doors, whether literal or figurative doors, things that lead into different spaces into different times. A door can be so much and there are so many different ways that that idea of passing between spaces shows up a lot in Kelly Link's books. In her collection, Get in Trouble, there's a story called The Summer People and this is a story about a girl named Fran. Her father has left to go to a prayer meeting in Miami. He's big into trying to heal himself through prayer. He drinks a lot. He's always gone for long periods of time. He's a caretaker for summer residents in guest cottages. But when he leaves, Fran has to become that caretaker. The summer people seems at the beginning to refer to the people who come to stay in these cottages during the summer, the people that Fran has to keep an eye on. You start to learn through encounters that Fran has with these summer residents that they're actually very different than what we thought. And there are sort of these dark workings and machinations behind the veil of Fran's daily living. It's hard to know what's real. Fran has a fever and she's taken a lot of NyQuil and so is Fran seeing spooky things that are in her mind because of her fever and the medicine? Or are these things that actually happen? The story gets more detailed and Fran brings somebody else into it, somebody else to eventually take care of the summer people. And that lends it some credibility, but at the same time, it still could be something that is imagined. In her collection called White Cat, black dog. Each story is specifically linked to a fairy tale. The title of that collection of stories is very interesting to me because dogs and cats, animals in general, appear in a lot of stories. People changing into animals or in and out of becoming an animal. And there are a lot of animals that appear in her novel especially. In one of the stories in White Cat, Black Dog called The White Cat's Divorce, this really rich man sends his sons off on these continuous quests that they, if completed, they might be the son that inherits his money. It starts by saying, all stories about divorce must begin some other place. And so let us begin with a man so very rich, he might reach out and have almost anything he desired, as well as many things that he did not. And so there really is nothing that his sons can get for him that's going to be the thing that satisfies him. What's interesting about that first sentence is the idea of a story being about something that needs to start being about something else. So in this story, The White Cat's Divorce, the youngest son stumbles upon a marijuana farm in Colorado that is operated by cats. He tells the cat in charge, this white cat, that his really rich father has sent him out in the world to find the most obedient and amiable dog a man has ever possessed. That was the first thing that his father wanted the sons to get for him. And the cat hands him a nut, a macadamia nut, and he can hear it, he can hear a little bit of barking in the nut. And she tells him to bring the nut back to his father to crack it open in front of his father. And that nut becomes a perfect dog. Later, this cat turns into a woman and then back into a cat. And this is a good example of a story so rich in this transference between animal and human lives and things and animals, nuts into dogs. But at the same time in the story, these cats run a marijuana farm in Colorado. And this story was written at a time when Colorado was one of the few places where this would have been allowed. This cat tells him on his trip back, his first trip back, she says, make sure you have not packed any edibles or weed because although marijuana is legal in the state of Colorado, we've heard from our customers that they sometimes encounter difficulties getting through airport security. So stuck in the middle of this magical 
fairy tale of a story is this very real detail about what might happen to somebody who is carrying something illegal at an airport. And those are just three stories out of three of her five collections. It's hard to know if I even made any sense talking about them at all because that is sort of what it feels like to me to talk about Kelly Link. I feel like the best way to talk about Kelly Link would honestly be to have a semester long college class specifically devoted to Kelly Link. So Kelly Link's novel is called The Book of Love. It is 628 pages, which seems like quite a feat coming from a short story writer. And it took her seven years to write. In my opinion, there is not a page that could have been edited out of that book. I didn't feel like I was reading a 628 page book. I was so absorbed in it. And it just was so full of everything I love from Kelly Link and more. It starts with these three high school characters, Mo, Daniel, and Laura, and they have died in the beginning of the book and then come back. They sort of just appear in this music room in their high school and their music teacher's there. Laura is sort of a type A person. Daniel, we learn, is this older brother to a brood of younger half siblings. And that sort of is very much in his character, always to be this big brother. He also happens to be physically very tall and big. And then there's Mo, who questions everything, who is a little bit more reserved, but very funny and very creative. And they are not sure where they have been. They've been in this limbo. They describe it as an awful place, a blotted, attenuated, chilly nothingness. And then they appear in this classroom with Mr. Annabin, their music teacher. To the people who love them and know them, they have disappeared. They assume that they've died. So Annabin and another person who appears first as an animal and changes into a person named Bogomil comes in and explains to these three that they have a challenge before them. Two of them can remain alive. Two of them will go back into sort of this underworld, which is the realm of Bogomil. In order to figure out who this happens to, they have to complete these tasks and essentially end up doing some magic and bring gifts. And it's sort of like this little odyssey to figure out the mystery of where they went, where they're going, and what happened to them. The reason there is this idea of two stay and two go is that there's a fourth person who's added to this threesome. This person doesn't know their name, so he calls himself Bowie. They are undead, basically, which is pretty complicated. They're also teenagers, also complicated. And then they have this thing placed in front of them, this other side and these supernatural entities who've presented these teenagers with their own agendas. And there's so much that Laura and Daniel and Mo have to navigate. Before we meet Laura and Daniel and Mo, we meet Laura's sister, Susanna. She is talking about Laura's disappearance and really grieving the loss of Laura, which is interesting because for the rest of the story, Laura and Susanna disagree quite a lot. When Mo and Laura and Daniel come back, they have a new story that's been given to the people who know them and love them, that they were in Ireland for a semester at a music school. And there are pictures to show it, and there are texts that they sent, and, and everything lines up with that story. There are so many multiples of voices in this book beyond these three characters. We hear from Susanna, we hear from their family members, we hear from people they know, we hear from inanimate objects. And each one of these things is called a book, a book of, a book of Mo, a book of Laura, a book of Daniel. And I feel like each one of these books could be pulled out and be its own short story. This novel is so many things. It is a love story, as the title would suggest but it also incorporates elements of a ghost story. It's a coming of age narrative. It's a portrayal of a small town. It takes place in a coastal town in Massachusetts that is very much a character in the book. The book delves into themes of magic, music, morality. It explores sibling relationships, family relationships, and the really deep and profound bonds that unite siblings and family members. It's sort of this mosaic put together of all these different interconnected stories, yet it goes beyond the boundaries of those stories. The book is bigger than the individual parts. It talks about family drama and grief and resilience and adaptability, the ability to sort of accept supernatural beings in your life and strange things happening to you and time being played with and doors leading to new worlds, the underworld, 
people in this book turn into animals. Sometimes they're turned into animals by other people. Sometimes they're able to do it by themselves. Laura and Mo and Daniel each come into their abilities to practice magic at different times and in different ways. I wouldn't describe the magic in this book as magical realism because the characters understand that they are practicing magic and that there are mag magical acts going on around them. They have knowledge that it is magic that is making things happen. Magic that makes statues come to life. It turns people into statues. Couches change colors, then turn into animals. There's a talking cat at one point, not unlike that story in White Cat, Black Dog. In the Book of Love, this cat eats itself. And in all of this, in all of these various parts, you are sort of just held captive as a reader. And I found myself devouring it. There's this mystery of what happened to these teenagers, but she gives herself 600 plus glorious pages to solve this mystery for us. These pages are so full of atmosphere and the character work in this book is amazing. I missed these characters when I was finished with the book. I felt like I knew them so well, despite the fact that they change in the book. I feel like you could give me a situation that happens outside this book and I could tell you how one of those characters might react within that. I wanted to know how their stories kept going even after 628 pages of their stories. This book is just so full of ideas and in each idea I feel like we're never just told the one thing. We'll be getting a chapter from someone, a book from someone like the book of Mo, but we learn from Mo that he was raised by his grandmother who was a famous and successful romance writer, a romance writer whose books Laura loves and has read all of. Mo's grandmother happens to also be a black woman. And so while we are in Mo's chapter, the plot is happening to Mo, we're getting this discussion of publishing and the intricacies of black women writing romance and writing popular series that are about white women. And that's just one little bit of an idea that we're getting. One of the chapters that really strikes me as something that could be pulled out on its own as a story is the book of Mary Ann. Mary Ann happens to be Mo's grandmother, this romance writer. This chapter looks at her entire life going backward and going forward. And it's really playing with time and memory in the same way that I saw in other stories that I've read of Lynx. Specifically, I think of that story, Lull, where time is going backward and memories are changed and played with. This book is called The Book of Love, and it is full of so many forms of love, romantic love, friendship, familial love. The book in and of itself feels like a love letter in that it seems to me like Kelly Link is giving us everything that she loves in this book. She has so much enthusiasm for every part of this book. It's funny, it's strange, it's heartfelt, it's beautiful, it's sad, it's magical, it's dizzying. There is a part in Lowell where the cheerleader in the closet with the devil says, I want a happy beginning. I want my friends to be happy too. I want to get along with my parents. I want a happy childhood. I want things to be better. I want them to keep getting better. I want you to be nice to me. I want to be famous. I don't know, maybe I could be a child actor or win state level spelling bees or even just cheer for winning teams. I want world peace, second chances. When I'm winning at poker, I don't have to put all that money back in the pot. I don't wanna to have to put my good cards back on top of the deck one by one. 